Hey class, this is going to be a demonstration of how to take something that has multiple recursion and transform it into an iterative uh, solution that doesn't use recursion. We talked previously how if it was linearly recursive, and if it only had one recursive call in it, that you could transform it into something that you say like a for loop. The problem is, is when you've got multiple pieces, uh, it's a little harder. So we're going to need to do something a little bit more intensive in order to get this all to work out. Now, in most cases where we, we do want to do this, we aren't working with things that are returning values, and that does make it a little bit more difficult. But I wanted to show how you can get this to work for something that is not the ideal case, so that when you get into things that are more natural fits, it's going to feel a little bit calmer for you. So right here, we've got our recursive Fibonacci. Uh, we've got a very simple uh, base case. If it's less than three, return a one. And otherwise, we're returning the sum of these two other Fibonacci calls. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, lay this out a little bit more. Let's see. I'm just making it so that it's going to be easier for me to transform into my non-recursive structure. There we go. So it's still the same function. Uh, if we go on and run it, we see that we've got our Fibonacci at 55. Everything seems to be working still. So. I'm going to come in here and I'm going to think about kind of where I am in the function. So here I'm at the start. And then if I get to this point, I'm, I've got to wait for the uh, recursion to come back. And then here I'm waiting again for the recursion to come back. And finally, I'm going to resolve. So the first thing is that there's there's these four states that I find myself in when I'm in this function, where you know I'm I'm waiting to get um, waiting to run. Here I'm waiting to hear back. I'm waiting to hear back. I'm going to resolve, and those are all states. And I can represent that with just a variable, um, like an integer. You know, like start is a one, wait ones, you know, two, three, four. The problem is, is that I then have to remember what each of those mean. I could use strings, but strings are a little expensive. So this is a good chance to learn about the enum. Enum allows us to basically create a new variable type uh, that is going to be each of these states. So I could say it has a start, has a wait one, and a wait two. And a resolve. And now when I want to use a variable of this type, start, wait one, wait two, and resolve are actual values that I can use for that type. Now the next thing I need to do is we're going to mimic those boxes that we drew, those frame uh, stack frames, when we were doing the recursive Fibonacci, you know, what we drew on the board. So let me start with that. Um, we need a new private static class frame. And it's going to have one of these frame states. And the way that you use the variable or the uh, the values is you need the name of the class, and then you say dot, and then you, you pop that right in there. So now that our initial state is start. The other thing I'm going to have in my frame is it's going to be a list of all the variables that I need. So I've got n, and then I've got temp1. And temp two. Okay, what else do I want? 
think that's pretty good. Let's go on and create a uh, constructor. Now, I don't need to initialize everything else. Uh, the state's already been initialized, and temp1 and temp2 won't get a value until later on in the function. But what I've got now is a place for all of my uh, memory. Now, you could be a little uh, more concise, right? We don't necessarily need this temp2, but I'm going to go on and have all of it there just to make it easier to, uh, to model. OK, so now I've got all the setup done. We're going to go and create our function. And there's a couple of tricks that we need to handle here. We're going to keep a variable for our return value. And then the big secret, given the name that we've got for our function, is that we're going to need a stack. And this stack is going to hold all of those frames as we're solving the problem. So I'm going to go on and say stack, a frame, give it a name like S. New stack. And it probably wants me to import. There we go. Now, here's the here's where the trick comes in. We start by putting our first problem onto the stack. So we're going to push a new frame of, and give it n. And then we're going to say while while the stack is not empty, then we're going to take a look at what's on the top of that stack and perform our actions. Right? We're gonna we're gonna basically run the function. So we got a lot of pieces here. Uh, I'm gonna say we need a current frame. And that's going to be s dot. And we really want to say top, but we find that there is no top. And that's because it's going to be called peak. This is just an implementation detail. That's how Java builds its stacks, is it uses a peak instead of a top. The other thing I want to do is I want to be looking at my frame state. And this is just for convenience to make the code a little shorter. Uh, I don't want to have to type cur.state over and over again. I just want to say state. So now I can take a look. I can say, look, if my state is equal to start, then I can handle that. And else if, boom, 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 yeah. If my state is equal to frame state dot wave one, else if my state is equal to frame state dot wave two, and then I think I just want one more else here to handle anything else that happens. OK, so what we're going to be doing is we're thinking about how do, how do these, these frames operate as we're going through our stack, or sorry, going through our, our problem. So if we take a look up here in our original program, when we start, we're now going to check for this base case. And if that's not true, then we're going to set ourselves up to start working on the next set of um, actions, right? We're going to call the next recursive function. So I need this if statement right here. And then I'm going to need to be ready to do this if that doesn't work out. So if ends, uh, not who's n, cur dot n is less than 3, then I don't want to return. I want to set return val equal to 1. 
right? That's that trick we're going to be using. We're going to have a return variable um, that moves outside of the step. So there's my return value. And then what else do we need to do? Well, I need to get this frame ready so that it can receive. Oh, wait. It didn't, it didn't, it didn't. Yeah. So if we can answer the question automatically, we want to pop ourselves off of the stack. And I think we're ready to go. Otherwise, right now we need to go and handle the else cases. We need to handle this case right here. So we notice that the state's going to change, and then we're also going to call that next function. The state changing, well, that's pretty easy. We're going to say cur.state, and then I can set it equal to frame state dot wait one. There we go. And now I need to then say s dot push. And we're going to do, 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 do a new frame. And this is cur dot n minus one. And that should do it. Now, what happens when we come back from that call? So this is basically going to push in this new, um, you know, smaller case. And then we'll come back up to the top of our while loop, and it's going to pop that one out. And then hopefully we'll solve it, or we're going to go and get one smaller again. Now, what happens when we return that first time? Well, once this function returns right here, we need to save that return value into temp1. And then we need to get our state reset and call the next recursive function. So let's go give that a shot. I'm going to set to 2. The return value. Okay, and I think that will do it here. And then we just need this last one. What happens at the very end? Well, in the very end, I can store it into temp2. I can change my state to resolve, but then I can return immediately, which means that that function is done. So let's handle that. Now, I probably don't need to be storing temp2, and I don't need to change my state to resolve, but I'm going to go on and include that here anyway, just to keep it consistent, right? I don't want it to think about um, you know, other things going on there. But now I can set my return value equal to cur.temp1 plus cur.temp2. And then I can say s dot pop because this function frame is no longer needed. Now I've got this else, and I could just leave it off, but I do like to throw in um, you know an error message because I should never get to this place. So I'm going to tell it to throw a new exception. Now throwing a new exception, it's going to force me to add the throws declaration. And I don't want to have to do with, deal with all of that. So I'm going to throw a new runtime exception. And runtime exceptions don't have to um, declare up at the uh, uh, in the function signature. OK, I think the last thing I need to do is to return my return val because that'll be the last function that pop will have the answer. OK, now the moment of truth. We're going to go and try to run this. Uh, it'll probably break the first time, but we've got to try it at some point.
we run it. Okay, that number is way too big. And I think I think what happened was here was the first time. The second time we should subtract by two. Right? We see that up here that it's it's minus one and then minus two. So I bet that was what was going on there. Because we were getting a nice power of two and we shouldn't, we shouldn't see that. So let's save it and we run it. Okay. So we could write our recursive code with something like this, or we can write it with something that looks like this. Once again, we could simplify this down quite a bit, but it's still going to be about half that code. You're still going to have this idea of a stack frame, and you're storing variables as you're moving through all of it. But uh, there are some really good applications where you want to remove the recursion and use a stack in order to solve your problem. Uh, like I said, when you're dealing with return values, uh, it's it's not quite as easy. So I'm glad that we got to see a hard problem. So one more thing uh, before we go, I'm going to go on and put a breakpoint in here just so that we can watch what's happening and see it in action. Uh, let's go on and then ladybug this. So the very first time it comes down here, after we did a recursion of 10, if we look in the stack, we're going to see that there's a frame. There's a frame for when n was equal to 10, n is equal to 6, and then all the way here is n is equal to 2. And so all of these, uh, these frames are in that stack, and they're, they're operating, and they're working. And so now if I come here and I hit resume, We'll see that now we're we're working for n. If we look at the one right above us, we see that um, we see that the previous stack n was three, and it's presently in that waiting for two state. It's already stored the one, and it's waiting for temp two, which is what we're going to give it back. So we could go on and uh, let's step over, step over, and then when we come in here. We see that we're going to um, peak, and we're we're at this frame right here. So if we move down, we're going to be here, and now we're going to fill in that frame. We're then going to set the return value, and then we're going to pop, and now we've got one less frame. So now it's going to work on four. So you can actually see all that work that we did by hand happening here inside the debugger. OK, well, I know that was a long example. Um, it's a really important example. It's one of those things that uh, everyone should know that it is possible. Um, and then you might be seeing some of the reasons why people don't always go and do that. OK, well, I will see you all in class. And uh, take care.